Thank you, Professor Floridi, for coming and um, being with us at our kickoff of the first um, AI and I event here in Berlin at the Soho House. We are really happy to have you. Um, you are heading the Digital Ethics Lab at the um, Oxford Internet Institute. When and why did you, your colleagues, actually came to the conclusion that ethics needs to be a special focus when researching the impact of the Internet? Many thanks for this invitation. It's a privilege to be with you. In academia, we try to anticipate time. Uh, that's called research. Uh, if you read it in The Economist, that's no longer research. Uh, it's interesting fact. So we, uh, quite early in, um, in the sort of new wave of digital revolution, namely the internet, quite early we came to the conclusion that uh, it was um, going to be deeply transformative. The realization was, um, we're talking about late 80s, early 90s, was that this was not, and maybe that's the only point important to grasp, was not going to be just a communication revolution like many others. In those days, people were talking about the ethical impact of a new uh, medium. Um, but I had the impression, I was much younger than now, but I had the impression that it was actually a new environment. That's an important difference. It's one thing to have something more like the TV or the radio and so on. It's another thing is to have a space where people spend time. And we don't live on the radio, on TV, but we live online. So that was the beginning. Uh, and he's pretty much uh, something like almost, my goodness, almost 30 years ago. All right. And meanwhile, you came to the conclusion in our lovely publication uh, where Alexander Gerlach interviewed you that the digital economy will dominate our life. And I was asking myself, isn't it actually dominating our lives already? What did you mean exactly? Yes, that, uh, that sentence uh, uh, is something that I'm not particularly proud of because, of course, everybody knows that uh, the digital dominates our economy. I think that there are a couple of points that might be a little bit more interesting to understand why that sentence in particular. One uh, is reconsidering what that exactly means. In the past we thought, once again, uh, coming from a different perspective, that we were going to replace atoms with bits. I don't know if uh, uh, the people who are with us uh, listening uh, remember. That's not the case. Uh, it was not the case at the time. I was skeptical at the time. I am even, even more skeptical today. We have produced more paper in recent years than ever before. We travel much more than ever before. The truth is that a digital economy is there to support, um, exploit, leverage what the analog world is already doing. So instead of thinking, oh, we will not have, for example, things, but we'll have uh, uh, virtual objects. The truth is that uh, the digital economy will enable us to do more with less and to do things that otherwise would be impossible. Uh, and now, in that sense, a digital economy is beginning now, and I'm more uh, in mind uh, things like Uber, for example. Uh, for good and bad, I mean, it's certainly disruptive. We do speak of Uberization of, of business and similar other uh, phenomena. In that sense, uh, I think this is the first point. Uh, a digital economy will be even more transformative than we have seen so far. The second point, uh, if I may, is that um, a digital economy does not have to be linked to consumerism. I think we thought in the past that it was to be more of the same, produce, produce, produce things that we will consume. But a digital economy, precisely because it um, enables us to do more with less, may also be a great force to join the green revolution and therefore a capitalist uh, view of uh, profit that doesn't have to be based on consuming the world but taking care of the world. And I think the digital there can help a lot. Yeah, indeed, it's a great potential that we haven't uh, even tapped into yet, I think, right? Um, let's take a closer look at a particular um, a part of the digital economy, but also society, at, at artificial intelligence, which will be the focus area of our event tonight. So we ask ourselves, and I want to ask you, if machines become increasingly intelligent, how will this impact the social cohesion of our societies? What's your take? Yes, machines are uh, becoming increasingly capable. Uh, I'm, I'm careful about intelligence because it can have so many meanings. Um, and therefore, the, those capabilities that ability to do things instead of us, sometimes better than us, uh, will certainly impact uh, our society. Uh, in this case too, maybe a, a quick comment may help. It's not a matter of um, 
dominating uh, our world or uh, some sort of super intelligence coming and uh, in a sort of a Terminator, Schwarzenegger way, uh, putting us into a sort of a pet's role of uh, a robotic uh, mentality. Uh, that is science fiction and we can leave it to Hollywood. The troubles and the, the concerns are, are much more serious. Um, in particular, we are looking at, um, just to pick up one of them, the benefits that all this uh, will bring. They will be enormous. Will they be also fairly distributed? Now, in terms of cohesion of a society, we're already seeing that our society has been uh, polarized. If we could make sure that the arrival of AI uh, brings a widespread uh, benefit to everybody, uh, well, then we would be uh, doing a better job than we're doing at the moment. Part of your work includes the modeling of human behavior. Can artificial intelligence finally help humans to better understand themselves and to better focus on the common good, as you pointed out? I think so. Um, partly, it has already done that. Uh, we have conceived ourselves as um, uniquely gifted when it comes to playing chess, parking uh, a car, uh, flying an airplane. Uh, we know that these things can be done differently, but equally successfully, or even more successfully, uh, by other means. Which is a way of rethinking who we are. Uh, now that links very well with a bit of a narrative that we have from modern times. At some point, I can't point exactly when, but at some point we became our jobs. It wasn't like that. If you read uh, you know, Shakespeare <laughs> uh, or Jane Austen, having a job was not a good thing. And uh, in fact, people were proud of not having a job. Uh, now, at some point, because of the Industrial Revolution, etc., uh, big city, etc., we started describing ourselves as job-related, and therefore a particular salary. Now, if the AI revolution can undo that, I think that that would be a good idea. I'm not my salary, I'm not my job. Uh, each of us is much more and, and differently uh, conceived of ourselves and each other. In that sense, the AI could uh, help us to have a better anthropology or philosophical view about ourselves. I think this is also part of the discussion why um, um, in Europe we particularly talk about the AI strategies in the US and in China and how Europe could fit into that. Um, and we see very different attitudes towards technology. Americans and also Chinese citizens seem to be much more affirmative when it comes to new technologies like and artificial intelligence. And Europeans tend to be much more skeptical. So, and you said in this context in, in the interview with Alexander Gerlach, we Europeans cannot allow ourselves to think in a utopian way. Could you please explain us why Europeans cannot be lighthearted when it comes to new technologies? Yeah, so what I meant by that remark was to um make sure that we do not fall into the trap of uh, having to solve everything immediately without thinking about the future. We need strategic thinking because this AI is going to be a marathon, it's not a spring. And uh, the people who will win the marathon are the ones who can pace themselves properly. And that's why we need an ethical framework. That's why Europe is well positioned for the marathon. At the same time, uh, thinking too much in the blue sky, in a way detached from the real world, as if it didn't matter, for example, to invest seriously in AI, to have the skills uh, in the you know, right stage uh, of the development of a population, uh, to unify efforts, to have a European project. Now, that is not utopian, that's concrete. So by using the word utopian, I meant let's be realistically forward-looking. The forward-looking provides the strategy, the realism provides the anchoring, in this sense, I think we are better positioned than anyone else in the world. Yeah, let's hope that we take on this recommendation and that European governments came to the conclusion what our third European way could be mm -hmm. on realizing the potential of AI. So last but not least, this is a question which we are asking all of our speakers today. Um, there is the public concerns um, regarding AI are nurtured by the discussion on singularity very much, not just on the impact of jobs. What's your view? Will machines be ruling the world in 10, 1500 years? What do you think? If I may be politically incorrect, the public is concerned about migrants, about singularity, and other fanciful things that would never happen and are not a problem. Shame on those who have actually made this real issues when they are not. It's not the other, whether a human being or a machine, the problem. 
is what we do with the resources and the opportunities we have today, which are enormous. So not in 10, not in 100, not in 1,000 years. When I have to remind people, oh, well then, is it impossible? Of course not. But it's unlikely, as myself, winning the lottery every time I buy the, the ticket. Possible? Maybe. Something I bank on? I don't think so. Great, thank you very much. Very interesting thoughts. <laughs>